there are certain types of bacteria that live on the thing that you touch the most throughout the day, and that's your phone. And is it really possible for a deadly bacteria to live on a phone and actually kill someone? And is it really possible that this bacteria can be resistant to all antibiotics known to man? Yes and yes. Most bacteria that live on phones, they're harmless, and most people don't get deadly infections from their phone. But this 48-year-old man wasn't so lucky after this bacteria called Acinetobacter did horrible things to his organs. And this so-called superbug is becoming more and more resistant to pretty much every antibiotic known to man. Before we get into this man's autopsy results, we need to look at what he was like before his infection. Now, he first sought medical attention because he started noticing he was getting a little short of breath. So let's rewind to when he was in his 20s. And at that point, he smoked cigarettes for four years. Uh, he starts getting a little short of breath. So he quits smoking. He was also diagnosed with asthma and treated with various inhalers and steroids, which sometimes made him better, sometimes not so much. And because he was becoming more and more short of breath, he sees a lung doctor and does breathing tests, the pulmonary function tests. And the results showed that his lungs are functioning very poorly. And the reason why is because he has a genetic condition called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So he gets treated for alpha-1 deficiency with weekly infusions of alpha-1 proteinase inhibitor. And this did help him as he did have fewer exacerbations of his pulmonary disease. But because of his asthma and his COPD, he was also put on a daily corticosteroid therapy and had three or four hospitalizations on average per year for these exacerbations, which were then treated with high dose steroids and antibiotics. His lungs eventually declined to the point that he needed double lung transplant. Pathological examination of his native lungs showed bolus emphysema, bronchiectasis, and other findings. But just because he gets a lung transplant doesn't mean that everything is all in well, as one of the huge downsides is that these patients require major immunosuppression to prevent the body from rejecting the transplanted lungs. So he started on immunosuppressant medications, specifically tacrolimus, mycophenolate, and altemtuzumab, and methylprednisolone, another steroid along with prophylactic antibiotics, antifungals, and antiviral medications to prevent infection. Two weeks after his surgery, things start to take a turn for the worst. His blood pressure goes down. His kidneys aren't making much urine. His white blood cell count is climbing. CAT scan of his chest shows he has a big pneumonia. He's requiring more and more oxygen to the point that he needs to be put on a ventilator. So a bronchoscopy is done to go and take a look inside the lungs and sample fluid from the inside of the lungs. The results of that sample showed that uh, when they put it under the microscope, it showed many white blood cells and many bacteria, specifically gram-negative rods and many gram-positive cocci in pairs. But at that point, the exact bacteria species wasn't known as it takes time to grow them in a Petri dish and identify them. So in the meantime, he's treated with the big gun antibiotics that kills a bunch of different bacteria, namely meropenem and vancomycin. Now, despite this, he fails to improve. He ends up dying several hours later. At his autopsy, they can see in his lungs that he had a severe acute bacterial pneumonia, as well as severe acute bronchitis caused by the bacteria known as Acinetobacter bomanii. So this bacteria was also found in his blood and in his spleen. So it was essentially spreading everywhere in his body. It turns out that this bacteria was resistant to all the antibiotics tested. This bacteria has emerged over recent years as a life-threatening bacteria in certain types of patients, particularly those who are immunosuppressed or have cancer or neonates who are hospitalized. What makes this Acinetobacter so dangerous is really two things. One is that it's usually resistant to just about all the antibiotics. And two is its ability to persist on the surfaces of beds, curtains, walls, sinks, medical devices, hand sanitizer bottles, even keyboards, and of course, phones. But this bug loves to infect patients on ventilators, especially 
if they're immunosuppressed. Deaths from untreatable infections like the one in this case have led to some experts suggesting that we're at the beginning of the post-antibiotic era. And subsequently, this has spurred intense research into alternative therapies over the recent years. One of the leading alternative therapies is with something called bacteriophages, which are viruses that infect bacteria. Now, in one famous case, there was a 68-year-old diabetic patient who had really bad pancreatitis, so really bad inflammation of the pancreas. This pancreatitis was the worst kind. It was necrotizing pancreatitis in which the pancreatic tissue literally dies off and turns to mush. And this was all caused by Acinetobacter infection. Now the doctors tried every tool in their shed to help this patient over a four month time span, including giving that patient the big gun antibiotics and even sticking a needle through the skin and into the pancreas to drain the fluid there in that pancreatic pseudocyst. But because this superbug was also resistant to every antibiotic, the patient did not get better. In fact, the patient was in a downward spiral. So out of desperation, the doctors tried something that is pretty much unheard of in modern medicine. They had microbiology laboratories identify specific bacteriophages that killed Acinetobacter. So they gave these bacteriophages to the patient through an IV, but they also injected it through the skin to go directly into the abscess located in the pancreas. And it wasn't until then they were finally able to ward off the infection. And lo and behold, the patient improved substantially. In the meantime, while alternative therapies like bacteriophages are still being developed, the most important aspect of treating these infections is actually preventing these infections, which is why antibiotic stewardship aimed at limiting the use of antibiotics is so important in order to prevent the further breeding of these multi-drug resistant bacteria. Other important aspects of preventing these infections is preventing the spread of these bacteria on contaminated surfaces. This includes proper hand hygiene, and real soap is even better, uh, contact precautions, chlorhexidine bathing, and wiping down commonly contaminated surfaces like the thing you touch the most throughout your day. Now, according to this study, Acinetobacter is one of the most common types of bacteria found on the phones of healthcare workers along with other bugs like E. coli, Staph aureus, and Pseudomonas. Someone recently sent me this special phone case, which is made by a company called Surive, S-U-R-I-V. I actually had no idea that something like this even existed, but they claim that the case materials have these antimicrobial properties that help protect against many common bacteria. And what's really cool is that the liquid dispenser in here uh, it actually can instantly spray your hands with this sanitizer. Obviously, you have to uh, fill it with hand sanitizer beforehand. Now, I have no idea if this thing has actually undergone any rigorous studies to test for bacteria and infections, but at least in theory, it makes a lot of sense because we know that bacteria such as Acinetobacter do like to live on hand sanitizer bottles right on here. But I do think this phone case would be especially useful for those who work in a healthcare environment. At least it's something that can be done that might help reduce the spread of nasty infections.